From prior discussions of alcohols, we're familiar with the hydroxyl group as a potential nucleophile, and after deprotonation, these groups can participate in nucleophilic substitution or addition reactions with electrophiles. A common base used in these reactions is sodium hydride, which is Na plus and H minus. And typically because all of the hydroxyl groups are similar in acidity, it's not possible for us to selectively deprotonate a hydroxyl group within a monosaccharide. And so we use a large excess of the base to ultimately deprotonate and react all of the hydroxyl groups. In this first example, we're treating with an alkyl halide electrophile, and so the essence of the reaction is SN2 substitution at the methyl carbon. In the product, we find new oxygen carbon bonds and new methyl groups linked to all of the hydroxyl oxygens in the original starting monosaccharide. And in this reaction, the methyl groups are all derived from this electrophilic CH3 group in the methyl bromide, and the hydroxyl oxygens act as nucleophiles via a series of alkoxide intermediates. And so they're sequentially deprotonated and then methylated, and because we're using a large excess of sodium hydride, we end up with complete reaction of all the hydroxyls. The second example is similar in that sodium hydride is used to deprotonate all of the hydroxyl groups, converting them to nucleophilic anionic alkoxides. But the electrophile we're using is different. We've switched from an alkyl halide to an acyl halide. And so from the electrophile's perspective, this reaction looks like nucleophilic acyl substitution. And if we abbreviate the acetyl group as AC, the final product that we end up with looks like this. Here again, each of the hydroxyl oxygens acts as a nucleophile after being deprotonated by sodium hydride. And the carbonyl carbons in acetyl chloride act as electrophiles, installing the acetyl group through a nucleophilic acyl substitution process, nucleophilic addition of the alkoxide to the carbonyl carbon, followed by beta elimination of chloride. One thing that I'll just note now and that we'll return to in more detail later is that if we hit either of these substituted monosaccharides with hydrolysis conditions, solvent quantities of water and acid, then we can selectively convert only the anomeric group back into a hydroxyl while leaving the other groups untouched. And this happens because we can convert the group I'm boxing in purple into a good leaving group and it will depart to form a stabilized cation which can then be attacked by water. None of the other oxygens can do this and form a stabilized cation after departure. This kind of exhaustive reaction of all the hydroxyls followed by hydrolysis of only the anomeric hydroxyl can be useful in the characterization of disaccharides, and we'll see this reactivity in more detail in a later video. Now let's move to oxidations and reductions of the carbonyl group, starting with reductions. Using either sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride as the reducing agent, the ketone or aldehyde group within a monosaccharide can be reduced to an alcohol, producing a compound that we might call a polyol containing a large number of hydroxyl groups. Now there's no carbonyl group in the cyclic form of the monosaccharide, but we need to keep in mind that this is in equilibrium with the small amount of its open chain form. And it's the open chain form, and more specifically this electrophilic carbonyl carbon in the aldehyde or ketone group, that reacts directly with the reducing agent. The key elementary step we've seen before, it's the nucleophilic addition of hydride, H-, to the carbonyl carbon. And then a complex metal hydride like borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride, it's not exactly H minus, but this gets the point across that the key elementary step is the addition of something like H minus or the equivalent of H minus to the carbonyl carbon. This produces an alkoxide intermediate, and after acidic workup, which protonates the alkoxide, we end up with the neutral polyol. Notice that this carbon, which was part of a carbonyl group in the open chain form, is now connected to a hydroxyl group, and it now bears two hydrogens, where it bore only one, actually in both the open chain form and the closed form. There it is in the closed or cyclic form, and there's that hydrogen in the open chain form. Now things get even more interesting when we start talking about oxidations of carbohydrates. If we just look briefly at glyceraldehyde, a triose, we see that a number of oxidations are possible. We can oxidize the aldehyde to a carboxylic acid, the secondary alcohol to a ketone, or the primary alcohol to an aldehyde 
or a carboxylic acid. And so it looks like we've got three sites for potential oxidation in this triose, and the situation just gets more complicated as we move to the larger sugars. So there's a question of how sugars will react under oxidative conditions. The way things have turned out, selective conditions have been developed to oxidize only the aldehyde under relatively mild conditions, or to oxidize both the aldehyde and the primary alcohol group that we find connected to a CH2 on the other side of the monosaccharide. It's possible to avoid oxidation of the secondary alcohols because they're more sterically hindered than the primary alcohol and the aldehyde groups. Let's look at examples of these reaction conditions in action with glucose as the substrate. When we treat glucose with a solution of elemental bromine in water, these are relatively mild oxidation conditions because Br2 is not a terribly strong oxidant. This leads to oxidation only at the anomeric carbon to form a carboxylic acid there. Notice what's happened to the oxidation number at the anomeric carbon. We've gone from plus two in the reactant to plus three in the product. So an oxidation has occurred from an aldehyde, is one way to think about it in the open chain form, to a carboxylic acid, which now cannot recyclize now that we've converted the aldehyde into a carboxylic acid. The other thing to point out here is that under these bromine and water conditions, the primary alcohol remains unreactive. It's not as easy to oxidize as the aldehyde, and so it remains unreactive under these relatively mild or weak oxidation conditions. Dilute nitric acid represents a stronger oxidizing agent than bromine water. The treatment of glucose with dilute nitric acid results in oxidation of both the primary alcohol and aldehyde groups. First, let's focus on the aldehyde or the anomeric position. Notice that an oxidation has occurred here from an aldehyde or a hemiacetal to a carboxylic acid. And in terms of oxidation number, we've once again gone from plus two to plus three. However, oxidation has also occurred at the primary alcohol. So in the cyclic form, the primary alcohol, carbon six, is located here. And if we look at the open chain form, the open chain product, we see that an oxidation has occurred at carbon six here as well. We've gone from an oxidation number of plus one at carbon six in the starting material to an oxidation number of plus three at carbon six in the product. And just as a point of interest, the product of mild oxidation, which contains a single carboxylic acid group, is called a gluconic acid. And the product of strong oxidation conditions, the diacid, is called a glucaric acid. Really the key point is that we can oxidize either the aldehyde alone or both the aldehyde and the primary alcohol in a monosaccharide just by a change in reaction conditions. And under both of these conditions, the secondary alcohol groups are unreactive.